Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Camilo Gonzalez Velasquez, and I'm an associate professor in endocrinology at the Universidad Autónoma de Nuevo León in Monterrey, Mexico, and co host of these Tired by MDs webinar series. Today, I am honored in, uh, to welcome and introduce to the, our today's wonderful speakers. I will start with Dr. Mustafa Alabusi. He's a radiology fellow in the University Health Network in the University of Toronto, Canada. He has recently completed his residency at McMaster University, Canada, and he has a special, a special research interest in diagnostic te test accuracy and is well versed in uh, systematic review and education research. Mustafa has, is the leading author for today's um, the study we'll, that we will be discussing today, which is titled Diagnostic Test Security of Ultrasonography versus Computer Tomography in Papillary Thyroid Cancer, Cervical Lymph Node Metastases, a Systematic Review and Meta Analysis. Additionally, I would like to present Dr. Sirim Vasan Harish, who is a musculoskeletal radiologist at St. Joseph Healthcare in Hamilton, Ontario. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Radiology at McMaster University. And Dr. Harris trained in orthopedics and, re and radiology in Cambridge in the United Kingdom. He received his MSK Imaging Fellowship at the University of McMaster. And with no further ado, uh, Mustafa, uh, the mic's all yours. So yeah, thank you so much. My name is uh, Mustafa, and I'm going to be talking about uh, this paper today. Um, so as uh, thank you for the very kind introduction. So it's titled uh, Diagnostic Test Accuracy of Ultrasonography versus computed tomography for papillary thyroid cancer, cervical lymph node metastasis, and it's a uh, systematic review and meta-analysis. And uh, I've got all the uh, wonderful uh, co-authors listed here, including Dr. Harish, who is the principal investigator for the study. And uh, there are no relevant conflicts of interest that is closed and the study was not funded. So uh, we'll start with the introduction and uh, some background. Um, so papillary thyroid cancer accounts for 85 to 90 percent of well-differentiated thyroid cancers, and regional lymph node metastasis is reported in up to 36 percent of adults with papillary thyroid cancer. Um, the most effective preoperative imaging uh, test for evaluation of papillary thyroid cancer is not established. And current guidelines, uh, including the American Thyroid Association and the uh, UK uh, National Multidisciplinary Guidelines, uh, recommend ultrasound for preoperative evaluation of primary thyroid tumors, as well as nodal metastasis. Cross-sectional imaging, such as CT, is only recommended in a number of small cases, including um, if the sufficient uh, ultrasound, like an experienced ultrasonographer is not available to form the examination, um, if there's bulky nodal mets or to evaluate the extent of more extensive disease. There was a study uh, by uh, lead author Bongas et al that assessed the role of computed tomography or CT in addition to ultrasound for staging of individuals with clinically low risk, well differentiated thyroid cancer, so predominantly papillary thyroid cancer. And they found that the addition of CT to ultrasound changed the surgical management in 22.5% of patients. And so in these patients where surgical management was changed, it was predominantly due to CT detecting clinically significant lymph nodes that were not visualized on, sorry, on ultrasound. And so the study highlighted the potential benefit of CT for the detection of cervical lymph node metastasis and subsequent improvement in surgical management of papillary thyroid cancer. So that brings us to the purpose of our study, which is to perform a diagnostic test accuracy, systematic review and meta-analysis to compare thyroid ultrasound and CT in the preoperative evaluation of papillary thyroid cancer for cervical lymph node metastasis. So in terms of this question, uh, we stratified lymph node metastasis into lateral compartments, including levels one to five, and central compartment, including level six, for the nodal metastasis. And as an additional secondary objective, we also wanted to see the, uh, the performance of ultrasound and CT for extrathyroidal disease extension in individuals with papillary thyroid cancer. So that's kind of framing the study and the question there. So we'll talk about the methods now. So um, this is a systematic view and meta-analysis. So we, we registered a protocol a priori on uh, PROSPERO, otherwise known as the International Prospective Register of Systematic Reviews, um, prior to commencing the study. And we followed contemporary guidelines for diagnostic test accuracy systematic reviews. So that includes the Cochrane Handbook, 
um, for, for this kind of study, as well as the uh, preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis guidelines or PRISMA guidelines, and specifically the, the DTA or diagnostic test accuracy extension for that. Uh, in terms of the institutional review board requirement, this was waived as per the institutional policy because all of this data is available in the public domain. It's from previously published studies. So after that, we made a comprehensive search strategy and just on the right, it's, it's just a screen cap of, of what that might look like. And we did a systematic literature search of Medline and Embates. Um, we looked for studies published from January 1st, 2000 to July 18th, 2020. And the results of the literature search were imported into a reference manager for review. In terms of the eligibility criteria, so for inclusion criteria, we define the population as individuals with treatment naive thyroid cancer, where greater than 90% of the total sample had papillary thyroid cancer. And we use that cutoff because um, sometimes the study had well differentiated thyroid cancer, and then they report that, oh, they're predominantly papillary thyroid and just a couple of cases of, of another subtype. In terms of the index test, we looked at um, ultrasound uh, and or CT of the neck for cervical lymph node metastasis, as well as or, uh, or um, extra thyroidal disease extension. In terms of the reference standard we use, those histopathology, cytology, or imaging follow-up. And in terms of the outcome, we're looking for diagnostic accuracy. So the sensitivity or specificity for cervical lymph node metastasis. And for that, we looked at either lateral compartment, central compartment, or some studies they did not specify. And, and we also looked for diagnostic accuracy of the extrathyroidal disease extension. In terms of exclusion criteria, Studies where patients had previous therapy or intervention were excluded. If the thyroid cancer subtype was not specified or wasn't stratified within the population, we couldn't include the study. And then if the non-papillary subtypes were greater than 10% of the population, we had to exclude the study. So um, we defined uh, our search strategy, conducted it, and defined our inclusion and exclusion criteria. Now it's time for kind of the screening and study selection and data extraction. So we had multiple investigators that completed title and abstract review independently. Um, so this was the phase one of screening. First, we did a pilot for the first 50 studies. So everyone did the first 50, just kind of for calibration and getting familiar with the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And then following that, there was independent screening. Once we went through that phase and had the potentially relevant articles, then we did a full text review. And so that was done by two investigators independently, and that was the phase two screen. Um, any discrepancies were resolved by consensus. And then if there was an ongoing discrepancy, then uh, it was discussed with a third reviewer, usually Dr. Harish, the PI, um, to figure out whether this would be a potentially relevant study to include. Um, yes. And then uh, in terms of uh, data extraction, so similar process, we did a pilot phase for the first three studies where everyone performed data extraction on them just to get familiar with the, um, with the process for that. And then we did independent uh, data extraction based on the, the criteria that we defined and discrepancies by consensus and the third reviewer if needed. Um, so, in addition to the data extraction, we also did a risk of bias assessment in all the studies. So we used the quality assessment of diagnostic accuracy studies two tools or the QUADAS2 tool. Um, and so this is what's generally been used for diagnostic test accuracy systematic reviews. And so we did an independent risk of bias assessment in duplicate, in duplicate for the following categories. So patient selection, index test, reference standard, and flow and timing. So some of the criteria, for example, for patient selection, we're looking at sample sampling method. Was it a random consecutive sample or was it a convenience sample or was it not reported? Were the inclusion exclusion criteria relevant? Did they make sense in terms of the index test? Um, was there blinding of the reporting radiologist or who was interpreting the studies to clinical and prior imaging data? Is there consistency of the imaging protocol used in the sample population? So did everyone get the same test or were there slight variations that might introduce bias? 
in terms of the reference standard, if imaging follow-up was used as a reference standard, how long was the length of follow-up? Was it sufficient enough to say, oh, for example, that there is no lymph node metastasis and the initial interpretation was correct? Um, and also looking at whether the same reference standard was applied across the population. So did they all get imaging follow-up? Did some get histopathology or cytology and some imaging, imaging follow-up? And could this have introduced bias in, into the study? And then in terms of flow and timing, the last category, um, this can be in terms of the length of timing between imaging tests or between the imaging test and the reference standard. So if they had an ultrasound that said, oh, there is suspicious, suspicious for cervical lymph node metastasis, but then the sampling was done four months later, um, so this could potentially introduce bias of so the time frame between the two. Or if they're comparing ultrasound and CT, but there's a significant time period between the two, um, between the two imaging tests, so then something could have changed in terms of the, the presence of node metastasis or not between the two tests. So that could also introduce bias. Um, and yeah, so we also performed a pilot assessment for this phase with the first three studies and uh, resolve discrepancies by consensus and a third reviewer if needed. Okay, so now it's on to the data synthesis portion. So once we've collected all of these, this information from the published studies, um, what do we do with it? So as discussed, the primary outcome was the diagnostic accuracy of ultrasound and CT for cervical lymph node metastasis. And we'll be talking about it in terms of, okay, diagnostic accuracy for lateral compartments and central compartments separately. Um, and we also tried to assess the diagnostic diagnostic accuracy for extrathyroidal disease extension for ultrasound and CT. We used a bivariate random effects model meta-analysis with 95% confidence intervals to summarize like for the data pooling. And then we produced coupled forest plots and hierarchical summary receiver operating characteristic curves to summarize the data. Then we also performed combined multivariate comparative meta regression. And um, so I'll explain this as we go through the results, uh, as it's a lot of, uh, can sound like a lot of jumbled words, but so basically it's a form of meta regression. So we use it to assess and compare imaging modalities by cervical compartment, as well as account for other covariates um, within the model. And these covariates being factors in the studies that may have been different, like study design, retrospective or prospective or that sort of thing, to account for these differences um, within the model and, and for like the diagnostic accuracy of process studies. For the comparative meta-regression models, we only included comparative design studies. So studies that directly compared ultrasound and CT. Um, the reason for that is it's, it's better practice because if it's the same population that gets ultrasound and CT, then at least a, a, a component of the factors in this population will be similar because it's, it's the same population. Whereas if you're taking one study that looked at ultrasound alone and then another completely different study that looked at CT alone, there may be a lot of different factors in these populations that affect the ultimate diagnostic accuracy. And then in terms of sources of variability in the data, this was explored through meta-regression and looking at these covariates that I was discussing uh, about a minute ago. And then per contemporary guidelines for diagnostic accuracy systematic reviews, public publication bias was not assessed for. Um, and the statistical analysis was done using STATA and R. Okay, so we'll get into the results now. Okay, so just showing the study flow diagram here. So initially we had just over 2,500 studies identified through the uh, literature search. And so those were all screened in terms of title and abstract screening. Ultimately, we identified 145 potentially relevant full text articles. And so the full texts were retrieved and those were screened. And in the end, we ended up with 47 potentially relevant studies through this search. So within these 47 studies, 44 of them reported on ultrasound, 15 of them reported on CT, and there were incidentally two that reported on MRI that we just included for reporting sake. And these were in studies where MRI was compared to another test. Um, and so you'll see that you know, 44, 15, and two is, is way more than 47, but um, a chunk of these were comparative studies. So 
you know, they compared ultrasound and CT, so there's overlap. So it's counted in each of these categories. So of these 47 studies, this accounted for almost 32,000 observations of thyroid cancer in total. So the exact number is 31,942, of which 31,895 had papillary thyroid cancer. So of that total sample, 47 had a well-differentiated thyroid cancer that was not papillary thyroid of the almost 32,000. Um, a total of um, 12,700 observations of cervical lymph node metastasis and 1,747 observations of extra thyroidal extension of disease were included. And so this, kind of, this number accounts for, uh, it's smaller than, than this one because it, it um, where ultrasound and CT were both performed, this was counted once in this, whereas the overall total, we just counted them separately because they're different uh, imaging tests. And then if you break it down individually, um, ultrasound alone had uh, 20,000 uh, observations, CT had 11,000 and MRI had 300. So uh, now looking at risk of bias. So based on the Quadus 2 tool, 21 of the studies were at a low risk for bias and the remaining 26 were at high risk for bias. And just a little breakdown in terms of contributors to the high risk for bias. So in terms of patient selection, a convenient sample or lack of reporting of sampling method could have contributed to risk of bias. In terms of the index test, um, inconsistent imaging protocols in the sample population um, contributed in kind of the, the studies that we had. Um, we, there was also a lack of blinding to prior imaging or clinical history that contributed. Uh, in terms of the reference standard and an inconsistent reference standard as kind of we discussed in, in the methods. And then for the flow and timing, uh, a greater than two month period or lack of reporting of the time period between the index tests and the reference standard also contributed in terms of the risk of bias. So um, now we'll look at cervical lymph node metastasis by compartment. So um, in the lateral compartment, ultrasound uh, had 17 studies that reported on almost 3,200 observations of thyroid cancer of which just over 1,200 had normal metastasis. In CT, there were 10 studies that reported on um, just over 1,800 observations of thyroid cancer and almost 700 had nodal metastasis. And then a total of eight studies directly compared the two imaging tests uh, for lateral compartment lymph node metastasis. So first I'll talk about the the individual pooling. So these are the results for all of the ultrasound studies. So the comparative studies and the non-comparative. And so the pooled uh, sensitivity for ultrasound was 82% and the pooled specificity was 84%. And here we've got the summary ROC curve with an area under the curve of uh, 0.9. For CT, the sensitivity was 72% for lateral compartment nodal metastasis. The specificity was 90%. And here we have the area under the curve with, an, uh, with the AUC being 0, 0 0.89. And now when we look at the eight comparative design studies only, so each of these studies directly compared ultrasound and CT within the same population, the calculated sensitivity for ultrasound was 73%. And for CT was 77% with um, confidence intervals that uh, were significantly overlapping. And in terms of specificity for ultrasound, it was 89% and for CT it was 88% with significantly overlapping confidence intervals. And so within the comparative meta-regression model, there was no significant difference in sensitivity or specificity for ultrasound and CT. And so those are the p-values greater than 0.05. And then in addition, within these meta-regression models, sensitivity was highest in retrospective multi-center trials and specificity was highest in prospective and single-center trials. So these are covariates that may have contributed to differences in the imaging between the studies, uh, like imaging performance. And so this is just to show you a summary of the comparative meta-regression where it reports a beta coefficient, uh, the standard error, and a p-value. 
And so the p-value is greater than 0 0.05 for ultrasound and uh, ultrasound versus CT for both sensitivity and specificity. And note for specificity, specificity is reported as one minus specificity. Um, and then we talked about kind of like retrospective versus uh, prospective. There was significant difference as well as um, single versus multi-center trials. And then risk of bias had no impact in this model. So now we move on to central compartment, cervical lymph node metastasis. And um, so for ultrasound, there were 17 studies reporting on almost 11,000 observations of thyroid cancer, of which almost 5,000 had normal metastasis. For CT, there were eight studies reporting on just over 8,000 observations of thyroid cancer with almost 3,700 with nodal metastasis. And so in terms of all of these studies, a total of seven directly compared ultrasound and CT for central compartment metastasis. And so starting with ultrasound for central compartment metastasis, um, we had a combined sensitivity, which was much lower of 40, 41% and specificity of 89%. And here we've got the area, uh, the AUC curve with the area under the curve uh, calculated at 0 0.69. And for CT, we have the pool sensitivity of 61% and specificity of 87% with the area under the curve uh, equaling uh, 0 0.66. And then, so again, for the seven comparative study designs for ultrasound and CT, the sensitivity for ultrasound was 28%, and for CT was 39%. And then the specificity for ultrasound was 95%, and for CT was 87%. So for central compartment nodal metastasis, in the meta regression model, sensitivity was actually higher in CT, and specificity was higher on ultrasound. And then uh, within the model, sensitivity was highest in retrospective studies at low risk for bias, and specificity was highest in prospective studies at high risk for bias. Um, and again, here's just a summary of, uh, of the meta regression model. I won't go too much into it again, but um, yeah, so sensitivity higher in CT and specificity higher in ultrasound. And then in terms of extra thyroidal disease extension, um, so there were 12 studies on ultrasound that reported on uh, almost 2,900 observations of thyroid cancer, of which just over 1,400 had extra thyroid extension. So we performed a data pooling for this data set and found that sensitivity was 91%, specificity was 47%, and the area under the curve was 0.76. For CT, unfortunately, we only found one study reporting on 377 observations, 174 of which had extra thyroid extension. So the sensitivity for that study was 86% and the specificity was 30%. Um, we can't really perform data pooling for, for the one study or compare to ultrasound because there's such a, uh, there's only one study for CT. And then we happen to have a couple of studies for MRI um, that reported on 300 observations of thyroid cancer and 152 of which had extra thyroidal extension. The sensitivity for these studies was 76 to 88%, and specificity was 75 to 93%. Um, again, for two studies, we can't really port, perform data pooling, and we didn't perform a comparison with meta regression to ultrasound, as this was not like part of the a priori plan for the study. Um, but just to note that specificity on ultrasound and CT is fairly low and, and significantly higher, or not significantly, but it looks like it's higher on MR. Um, but yeah, so we couldn't really have, uh, we didn't have sufficient comparative design studies for matter regression. So, and then just very briefly, uh, in terms of studies within each imaging modality that compared lateral and central compartment accuracy, we found that uh, for ultrasound, it was more uh, sensitive for lateral compartment nodal METs, um, and there was no significant difference in specificity between the two. Um, and then for CT, um, sensitivity was again, higher for lateral compartment nodal mets and no significant difference was found for specificity. And now we'll talk about the dis discussion. So the, um, we found that the diagnostic accuracy of ultrasound and CT, 
for uh, cervical lymph node metastasis and extrathyroidal extension in 47 studies, uh, looking at almost 3,200, uh, 32,000 observations of predominantly papillothyroid cancer. We found no significant difference between ultrasound and CT for lateral, lateral compartmental metastasis. Um, and then we found both ultrasound and CT had an overall low sensitivity for central compartment nodal metastasis. Um, CT was, however, more sensitive for central compartment, and ultrasound was more specific. Um, and just to go back and kind of discuss, so as we mentioned, current guidelines, including the ATA and the UK National Multi Multidisciplinary Guidelines, um, recommend ultrasound for preoperative evaluation of primary thyroid tumors um, and nodal metastasis. Based on our findings, um, CT may be beneficial in specific cases for lateral compartment assessments. Um, just to note, so there was a study conducted by Park et al. that found that arterial phase CT uh, improved the accuracy for lateral compartment nodal metastasis in uh, papillary thyroid cancer. Um, for our study, we, uh, we couldn't really assess the optimal CT technique as it was not reported in, in most of the studies or just was not different, like not, uh, not many or uh, any really assessed arterial phase CT. And um, yeah, so CT was more sensitive and less specific than ultrasound for central compartment nodal metastasis, but uh, it may provide an added benefit for staging, um, for assessing the lungs uh, and treatment planning in that sense. Uh, and so going back to that study by Bongers et al, um, so that found that CT changed surgical management in 22.5% when it was added on to ultrasound. In these patients, it was predominantly for the detection of central compartment nodal metastasis that were not seen on ultrasound. Um, and there were addi an additional two studies published in the literature that found CT in addition to ultrasound improved the sensitivity for central compartment uh, metastasis compared to ultrasound and CT alone. So this may be something of value to, to, to further assess in terms of the combined role, um, but it does seem like there may be some benefit of, of adding CT to ultrasounds. And then um, just in terms of the extra thyroidal uh, disease extension, um, there is a high sensitivity of ultrasound and CT, um, but both were fairly poor in specificity. Um, in the two studies that assessed MRI, uh, for extrathyroidal disease extension, the sensitivities were comparable, um, but MRI seemed to report much higher specificities, although they're not directly comparing the, uh, the modalities. So Lou, Lou et al. found a prom promising sensitivity for MRI for central compartment nodal meds as well of 75%. And um, so in terms of these findings and these studies, um, if there is a future role for preoperative MRI staging for papillothyroid cancer, further study of the role of MRI, particularly for central compartment nodal nets and um, for extrathyroidal disease extension would be warranted. So in terms of the limitations of the study, um, so we assess diagnostic accuracy. And so that does not ref necessarily reflect changes in management and particularly surgical management. And we focused on comparison of individual modalities. We didn't really look into, okay, how about the role of ultrasound and CT compared to the individual modality? So um, our study doesn't really comment on that. Um, we also had a lack of studies for comparative assessment of extrathyroidal disease extension. Um, we did not search the gray literature for un unpublished studies. Um, and multiple studies were considered at high risk for bias. Um, however, we tried to account for that by including risk of bias as a covariate within our meta-regression model analysis. In conclusion, um, there is no significant difference in the diagnostic accuracy of ultrasound and CT for lateral compartment cervical lymph node metastasis and papillary thyroid cancer. And for central compartment, although there was low overall sensitivity, um, CT was more sensitive and ultrasound was more specific. Um, further study of the role of CT in preoperative papillary thyroid cancer staging is warranted, um, possibly as an adjunct to ultrasound. Um, these are the references used. And again, so disclosures, as I mentioned earlier, no relevant conflicts of interest and the study was not funded. And uh, this is just the last slide here. Um, thank you so much for listening. 
Um, hope it was helpful. And uh, yeah. Staff, I want to I wanna thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation uh, and a very well conducted and very strong methodolog methodologically strong uh, study that you shared with us. I'm going to okay, give so doc Dr. Harris the mic so he can um, give us a, a little bit of his insights on, on, the, on the project and then we'll go into a little bit of a Q&A at the end. I do encourage all of the, all of the attendees to um, send in their questions through the Q&A function so we can add them, ask them at the end. Thanks so much. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to give a reason for why we decided to do the study in the first place. Uh, we are uh, St. Joe's Hamilton busy uh, head and neck service for cancer, a uh, lot of thyroid cancer referrals that we see on a weekly basis. And um, obviously we have weekly uh, thyroid cancer rounds. And one of the things that I observe as a radiologist is a couple of uh, surgeons having uh, directly contrasting views on the need for routine CT in uh, evaluation of thyroid. One of both were experienced, one has been doing it for 40 years, just retired and the other about 15 years. And both are co-authors on this study. And uh, you know, uh, Dr. Young, uh, Ted Young, who's been doing it for 40 years, argued that based on his experience that every patient needed a CT and he did that. And every patient had a CT before he operated on the thyroid cancer where Dr. Michael Gupta, the other surgeon, would only do it where he felt that there could be clinically palpable lateral compartment nodes. There wasn't a real concern about central compartment nodes because they dissected them in every case that they did the total thyroidectomy on. So, and then I came across a few studies which uh, Mustafa had mentioned by uh, Park et al, which introduced new technique, which is using an arterial phase CT for improved sensitivity of thyroid cancer, which we introduced in our department uh, at the same time around 2017 or something. And, and my personal experience, although I have not conducted any study on that, that improved sensitivity in detecting lateral compartment lymph node vessels. You can have even a small lymph node, which could be hypervascular and, in, and you could pick up those metastases. And then, you know, we never in our department used ultrasound as a primary modality to specifically interrogate the lateral compartment lymph nodes. Um, and so the question was, do we need to do in everything? Would it change management? And then came across the study by Bongos et al. from UH in Toronto, which showed a difference. Now, the big bias in their study is they, they didn't have ultrasound or CT uh, uniformly reported by people interested in reporting thyroid studies. There is a certain, um, you know, a skill to interpreting those two. They just collected ultrasound reports that were done in many outside centers, and they used that as a basis for accuracy. And no wonder that ultrasound showed low accuracy. And also same with CT. They didn't have the CTs coming from outside to the tertiary center interpreted by their own head and radiologist. They just took the report as a face value. Fair enough. So my question has always been, you know, if you're in a thyroid cancer study, somebody skilled in ultrasound looking at it, and then somebody skilled in CT looking at it, would CT make a difference in picking up lymph node metastasis that may or may not search surgical management? So this is the basis for, and towards that, the first thing to do was to do this. Uh, uh, I roped in uh, Mustafa and uh, Abdullah, uh, the brothers uh, who have a lot of expertise in the systematic analysis, uh, metallicist study to do that, to see what's out there, to know what's out there uh, before we plan any future prospective studies to actually answer the question. And uh, I mean, in, in all this, we recognize that ultimately it may not change patient prognosis, but would it change patient management has been the question. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and that's my kind of... Uh, you you bring a couple of very interesting points, and and the the one of the questions sent from the from the audience is um, uh, based on the results. When do we recommend combining ultrasound and, and CT? So that brings a, a, a whole different level of, of of a question, because how do we take this information and take this as we say from bench to bedside? You know, like okay, so it's it's more. Just, uh, the specificity and sensitivity in central uh, lymph node met metastases is a little bit different, but does it really make a difference as you were saying? And it, with that in mind, when do we combine it? Where, when would you say it's a good idea to use both modalities at the same time to make um, actionable, uh, I don't know, differences in, in, in the treatment of our patients? Um, the short answer is I don't know, but... Um... 
uh, I, I mean, uh, I'll tell you in my department, because of one person, you know, uh, trying to order CT in every case, the newer surgeons who've been recruited are tending to ask CT in almost every case. So that's the trend going on. Um, the other thing is, if you have an operator in your radiology department or ultrasound who does a comprehensive evaluation of lateral compartment lymph nodes, you don't palpate anything clinically and nothing has been seen on ultrasound, maybe CT is not necessary. But if you don't have good ultrasound expertise, and you may be and or you may be palpating some lateral compartment lymph nodes, then it might be a good idea to do CT. This needs to be proven, but right now that's where I stand. Thank you very much. Dr. Aiken, in your uh, experience, uh, um, CT for all, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think that it's important. In, um, and first of all, um, congratulations on this study and a uh, wonderful presentation here. Um, I, I, I do think that there are specific areas where CT um, provides added benefit. And um, while I used to... Um, do CT scans on the vast majority of my patients, um, it's now uh, a much more selective approach. There are obviously two areas um, in particular where uh, ultrasound uh, does not provide information. One is uh, retropharyngeal lymph nodes. Um, and that's usually um, a problem in patients with very bulky lateral compartment adenopathy um, and, uh, and or recurrent disease. And then um, the mediastinum, which uh, both of these areas being beyond the, uh, the reach of an ultrasound probe. And so that's, um, those areas are usually only um, of importance to, um, uh, to inquire about in patients who um, obviously have significantly advanced disease and or um, were previously treated. So those um, that and patients who have present with evidence of invasive disease, um, in particular, the presence of a, um, a, um, of a recurrent laryngeal nerve um, involvement uh, with a, presenting with vocal cord paralysis, those patients all get um, CT scan in my hands uh, because we're looking to uh, get more, more detailed information. So with that in mind, um, it's, uh, for me, it's a much more selective approach. I will say that I do believe that um, there are situations um, where CT scan will provide more information regarding areas um, uh, such as retrojugular or retrocarotid that may not be detected by ultrasound. Fair enough. Um, one question that I want to uh, greet Dr. M M Michael Tuttle, who sent a uh, question from in the audience. Uh, he, he's asking, since uh, ultrasound is very uh, user dependent, do we think that the addition of uh, NEXT-CT would be of value in the community setting where radiologists may be more confident with reading CTs than ultrasounds? Yeah, I think that goes back to what uh, Dr. Erkin was saying as well. So if you have, if you know an ultrasound operator who can, you know, look at the thyroid, comprehensively look at the lateral compartment as best as one can. Obviously, with the caveat, you might miss the uh, retropharyngeal lymph node and nothing is seen. And clinically, it seems like, a, you know, non-invasive disease, then you probably don't need a, you know, a CT. But uh, if you don't know the operator that someone has done a comprehensive search for the lymph node disease, then you are maybe better off with CT uh, in a very selective approach, yeah. And what do you think, trying to translate this data um, into the different um, specialties or medical specialties that might be reading the reports from these studies? Being, I, I don't know, like for example, endocrinologist might feel a little bit more um, familiar with, with ultrasound being that they are more familiar with the uh, Tyrod's classification system, whereas we don't have something similar to that in, when we do CT. Uh, what do you think about that? Or, or I don't know, maybe a surgeon versus an endocrinologist or a radiologist. Um, what Dr. Tuttle was mentioning, I think it's, a, it's a, one of the biggest problems because we do have to acknowledge that the vast majority of the, of the imaging modalities that we get for a, at least pre-op assessment of a thyroid nodule or a thyroid nodular disease do come from a community setting. So 
Just adding a CT routine, routinely for, for the assessment of these patients, do you think that's value added? I don't think there's necessary to add a CT in every case. I mean, if you're getting a two centimeter well differentiated papillary thyroid carcinoma, nothing seen on clinical palpation, nothing seen on ultrasound, I don't think CT might add anything. But as I said, anything clinically, you feel there's invasive disease, you palpate something, uh, or something was seen on ultrasound, then I think a CT would be. I don't think there's a role for routine CT, although many of our surgeons tend to do that. Perfect. Mustafa, coming back to the to the study, I, I found it interesting that you included the evaluation of extrathyroidal extension when the primary focus of the study was um, lymph, uh, local regional disease in lymph nodes. Um, when when I read that, I had almost a feeling of, and I don't, I know Dr. Rick is gonna um, be interested in this in this question. Why didn't you also include uh, evaluation of extra nodal disease more so than extra extra thyroid disease? Um, so you're asking, so your question is why not include ex, extra nodal disease as in like lymph nodes elsewhere? No, no, meaning, meaning you, you were speaking about ETE, so like mm -hmm. disease outside the, 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 the mm -hmm. thyroid nodule, but what about extra nodal disease, E and E, as in outside the, uh, the lymph, lymph node metastases? Uh, yeah, so extra, that's a good question. Um, so, I mean, one of the things in terms of looking at the studies, we included some of them used that as a criteria, like on if it's seen on ultrasound or CT to establish that there is lymph node meds or that sort of thing. But um, otherwise, I would have to double check. D Dr. Harish, I don't remember if we, yeah. like when we had the initial discussions. Yeah, we personally have not seen many cases of extranodal extension of uh, disease in lymph nodes in papillary as opposed to we see with the, you know, squamous cell carcinoma. So we didn't think of that as an important question to be answered. And that's perhaps thinking back what we decided two, three years back, I think that's probably the reason we didn't go into that. Yeah. Camilo, I think um, an interesting academic question, but not a management um, a differentiating point. If we knew that somebody had extranodal extension um, up front, if, if that's the question, would it change our management? I guess um, uh, the answer is I, I doubt it, certainly in the primary setting here. In the, in the, state, in the situation of recurrence, I think that's, um, that might change um, our perspective and might impact the decision to watch a lymph node versus um, uh, I'm recommending salvage surgery to address uh, recurrent nodal disease. But I think in the primary setting, um, I, I don't think it would it would affect management decisions here. Great. And um, how would you incorporate the data that you found in, in the MR study into uh, future steps or future directions for research in, in imaging modalities for primary uh, thyroid nodular disease? So, go ahead. In terms of the MRI, our experience so far, we've done it in few cases for problem solving. The results have not been great. I mean, uh, uh, personally, I've not found uh, uh, MRI of any huge benefit when you have good ultrasound or CT in managing these cases. We, it's just patient moves, there's more artifact. And, and, and like CT or ultrasound, there's not defined imaging criteria to call something node and stuff like that. So I don't know. I, I personally, I'm not sold on uh, MRI for uh, uh, thyroid cancer uh, imaging. Maybe a few problem solving cases here and there. Even that has turned out to be unsatisfactory in my experience. Camilo, I think there's, you know, one other or two other questions here. One is, um, and obviously this provides some credence to this, to this question, that's the added cost and the radiation exposure. Um, uh, to patients, and maybe you can just comment on that. Yeah, um, certainly uh, young patients with papillary thyroid cancer, which tends to be the usual presentation, do, uh, there's definitely a, a decent radiation dose to the thyroid, and, uh, and it can only be justified if there's going to be uh, 
it's significant change in uh, surgical management and prognosis. So that is one of the reasons to use caution in selecting which patients you're going to order a CT as opposed to just an ultrasound, uh, ra rather than uh, doing routinely in every case. Uh, Mm -hmm. And cost, Dr. Farish? Yeah, cost of a CT with contrast and stuff. Um, it you know in Canadian dollars, it's probably close to seven hundred, eight hundred dollars. Probably more in the US. Um, uh, so as opposed to an ultrasound, which uh, would cost hundred dollars. So there's a seven times difference in cost between doing a good ultrasound and a good CT for sure. Yeah. Great. Thank so you. We're going to be looking at the cost benefit analysis, which is not the purpose of the study. That's another big thing is the extra, assuming you do a CT in everyone, is that added cost justified in ultimate patient management and prognosis? Uh, the answer is I don't know, but I suspect the answer it's probably not justified. Great. So I, I believe this all comes down to identifying the right patient for, for the right imaging modality. And as you were saying, I, I, I do understand that the e, e scenario in the primary setting is, is unlikely, but the, the added value of, of where we have like very extensive or deep, deep in the neck lymph nodes, for example, as you were mentioning, Dr. Rick, and the retro and parapharyngeal people that are that in the primary setting, that is also very unique or not, uh, or thankfully not very common. But how do we identify, or what would you look for in ultrasound or patient characteristics that would make you do that double imaging, where you already have an ultrasound and you need a second, a second imaging modality to complete and guide the, the treatment? Yeah, that's the question as well as even in uh, for ultrasound for assessment of uh, lymph node metastasis, uh, you need an astute operator. Uh, we know that the size criteria does not matter with papillary thyroid metastasis. We found three millimeter hypervascular you nodes know, that are turned out to be metastasis. So it, it's not just looking and measuring the size. The operator needs to look for the microcalcifications if necessary, the increased hyalur vascularity, hyperechoic. So more definitions of the sonographic criteria for picking up lymph node metastasis needs to be published, I feel. Um, it's much more. Um, uh, easier on CT, I find, than in ultrasound. Um, and then you got to narrow the number of people who do these ultrasounds in in the tertiary. Even if you get an outside ultrasound report, repeat the ultrasound in a center where they have more experience in looking at these nodes. Um, and then if then in doubt, then go on to uh, do a CT. Um, I feel there needs to be more uh, studies on what exactly are people looking for in these lymph nodes in the setting of papillary that are to call them as metastasis or normal? Because size does not matter as opposed to many other conditions. So that's where it comes. Correct. We, we were mentioning the, the costs of doing um, different image modalities before. And as Dr. Tull had mentioned before, the, the problem of having community uh, sonographers uh, performing uh, thyroid ultrasound. Often, more often than not, has, has us do a repeat ultrasound, as you were mentioning right now, uh, for those patients where the information isn't clear, or we feel um, that the, the disease was not evaluated completely or entirely in, in the pre-op setting. And that adds the second value. So I, I do believe, as Dr. Tal was mentioning, that performing an, uh, a CT in some instances might, if we could say that, lower the cost for those repeat ultrasounds that you might need to get to guide decision-making in the treatment of uh, nodular and local regional disease. Dr. Aiken, what do you think? Well, it just, I think this really just depends um, on the situation. If we get, um, and, and looking at, um, uh, at, at the expertise on cross-sectional imaging in the community. I think if, if that's the question, um, I, th I think it's highly variable and it's hard to project um, as to uh, where greater expertise is going to reside um, on the ultras in performing an ultrasound or interpreting a CT scan. Um, the one thing about CT, obviously, that comes into play is, and, and we've talked about this extensively, is um, that the value added 
um, for CT really requires uh, giving contrast and then the impact of that. But I think we've sort of negated that for the vast majority of patients that that delay will, will cause a problem. But it's just one more thing to put into the mix here. So I, I, I'm not sure um, about um, where greater expertise resides, whether it's on um, in, in looking at the specific details of lymph node involvement, um, whether it's in CT versus ultrasound. So uh, just following on the, one of the things that we would like to do in the future um, is uh, actually do a prospective study um, where, you know, uh, when patient gets referred for primary assessment of papillary thyroid cancer, um, we do a proper ultrasound by dedicated to two users in the department um, and then uh, followed by CT. So it's all uh, tightly controlled as to who's reading and performing these images and then see what difference if, if it makes to management, if any. Um, uh, this kind of follows from the Bonga study, except that tightly control uh, to variables as to the operators for ultrasound and who read CT and see if that would truly change any uh, surgical management. This is really interesting. Uh, and especially um, going back to what Mustafa was mentioning about the timing and flow of the difference, the, the bias that could be introduced with the timing and flow of the two different imaging modalities. Mm -hmm. So the, one of the things we we're planning is just also when what initially we'll do the ultrasound, including the assessment for the tirads, look for the lymph node metastasis and stuff. And then the surgeon would fill in a form saying what their management would be at that point, and then blind it to the CT report, and then look at the CT report and then give a separate management decision. And, and then compare the two after doing a certain number of cases to see if CT has changed surgical or patient management in any of these cases. Uh, we've done that in a few on my, I have my other area of expertise in MSK, we've done that. So it's something to want to follow that same format in thyroid cancer to see if it, that's the plan for the near future. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, it's an interesting study design. I think it's probably what would be needed in order to answer this question. Do you have any idea what kind of a number uh, you'd need to power that kind of a study? I don't know. Um, previously, uh, when I did this with spines and ankles in the MSK, we've done like 50 cases, but I have to uh, find a little bit more details. And the Bonga study, they used only, uh, uh, do you remember Mustafa? It's like 50 or 60 cases. Uh, I but, think something like that, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it was in that ballpark, but I can double check as you're... Um, but also, like, if they reported 22% change in surgical management, so if it's, like, theoretically, one in five is the expected, that can also give an idea of, like, in terms of the sample size calculation and that sort of thing. Yeah, the key thing for me is to open the surgeons to actually fill those forms at that time before reading the CT report so that there's a true reflection of if there's a change in management. So to answer your question, I don't know the power, something I need to look at, but I'm thinking 50, but that uh, could be different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. So that, that's just very interesting. And would you would you assess the what what the actual management was post op? So you would ask the surgeon preoperatively like what the plan is based on the imaging and then post op again. Right. So uh, so they do get the ultrasound and fill in a form. And then that's the management, and then they get the CT report, and then they will uh, do the management, and then we'll follow up and see what the actual management was, and then give it at least where to see there was a record. Of um, uh, to see they followed up on that management, yes. Beautiful. So at this point, Dr. Ekin, I don't know if you have any, any further questions um, for, for our presenters here. Um, if not, we, we, wanna, we wanna thank you both for, for joining us today. Um, this was in a very, as I've said before, a very interesting, oh, we do have another, Another question. Um, so it says, would thyroid level play would thyroid play any level in deciding which imaging modality, or is it entirely uh, dependent on size and location? So I'm, I'm guessing 
they're asking if would the Tyrant's classification uh, of the nodular disease would play any 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 role deciding which imaging modality you would have to take. I'm guessing by that, by, that, by that time we would have done ultrasound already, but would it would, it, would the Tyrant's classification guide you to performing CT subsequently? I don't think so, but I'll let Dr. Arkan answer that. But uh, I think because by the time you got your thyroid, there has to be a 4B or above and the patients had a proven, proven thyroid cancer. So um, I don't think that thyroids would necessarily influence whether you do ultrasound or CT. The thyroid cancer is a thyroid cancer. Yeah, I, I would, yeah, I would totally agree with that, Camilo. Correct. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you um, for your presentations. Um, a fascinating study. I think obviously it opens up a whole another set of questions that we've talked through here. Um, and, uh, and hopefully uh, you will do that prospective study because I think that's really what's gonna be needed here um, in order to uh, come up with a conclusive answer. My guess is at the end of the day, patient selection will be the critical um, factor here to determine the importance of um, doing CT. I can't imagine uh, that we will be looking at a CT scan for all um, papillary thyroid uh, patients. I, th I think that um, that's highly unlikely, um, uh, but uh, looking forward to that publication when you finish it. Thank you, we'll do. <laughs> Great, terrific. Do let us know. So um, thank you for joining us. And um, we hope to see you here next week. We'll have Dr. Robert Fravel uh, uh, do, um, performing a lecture on thyroid cancer imaging, an update on thyroid cancer imaging. So very ad hoc to what we were speaking right now. So thank you all. Have a great weekend and hope you are, are all safe.